Well, good morning. So good to see you here. Hey, uh, welcome to the second week of this series, The Power of Your Words. If, uh, if you were here last week, you experienced a pretty uh, supernatural service where God did some absolutely incredible things uh, in your life. Let me sum up last week very quickly before we move forward. Last week, we talked about how we can show love to those we love the most. So instead of put-downs and insults, we learn that we need to give compliments to others. We need to be in the business of building each other up, not bringing each other down. We also looked at, you know, instead of having hateful actions that cause people to retreat and avoid you, we need to be people that show affection so people know that we truly love them. And then third, last week, we talked about how we have to stop speaking words of death over people, which brings destruction and bitterness. And we need to speak words of life over others, words that open doors of praise in each other's life. Friends, I want you to know that this past week, I spent many hours on my hands and knees praying for each of you. Praying specifically that your week would be filled with words of life, words of love, and words of praise, where hopefully you built people up and you didn't tear people down. So I pray that that was true in your life this week. Now, as we continue this journey this morning, we are once again going to look at some very tough topics. And so today, we are going to discuss the most common temptations of the tongue. In fact, these temptations are so tough that the only way to fully process them was for me to divide this message into two parts. So this week will be part one, and we are going to look at temptations one through five. And then next week, we will look at temptations six through ten. Now, quick disclaimer, right as we get started this week. Today's message is intended to bring to light areas of our life that we often bury and areas that we often refuse to acknowledge. Now look, there's not going to be much of a a resolution with today's message because I really want to first help you identify the top five temptations of the tongue. And my hope is that you will be able to begin processing which of these areas you struggle in the most. You see, the first part of the battle is identifying the problem. And so that's the goal of today's message, and it's the goal of next week's message. We have to identify the problem. Now, two weeks from today, I'm going to provide you biblical solutions for how you can, in fact, tame your tongue, how you can take control over your tongue. So I want to encourage you now as we get started I hope that you have a pen or a pencil. Make sure you take out that uh, sheet of paper, the sermon notes, and the program. And my hope is that you will just start marking everything up because I believe God has major freedom for you today. I'm going to be working kind of fast because there's a lot of ground to cover. But uh, my hope is that you will review your notes throughout the week because, as I mentioned, I know that God has freedom for you in this area of taming your tongue. So with your pen and your paper, hopefully in your hand, let's dive in. So here's the question that I really want us to to start trying to gather answers for. How can I avoid speaking words of death into the lives of others? The first thing, uh, top 10 temptation of the tongue, stop telling lies. Friends, in our culture today, lying is actually expected in many ways. Lying is in some ways, even encouraged. I mean, we see husbands and wives lying to each other. We see advertisements that lie to you simply so you will just buy the product. We even have politicians that lie so they can get the vote or avoid a public fallout. You see, while culture tells us that lying is something you have to do, God is the opposite, and he tells us lying is something you should never do. In fact, God uses some some really strong language when it comes to lying. He says that he hates it. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. 
Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Friends, I want you to take a second and let that verse sink into your heart for a moment. Look, there, there aren't many times in God's word where he says he hates something. Typically, we, we read about God's incredible love for everything. But here, we read about some things that God hates. And if you look at this list closely that we just read, you will see a, a specific thing that surfaces twice. A lying tongue and a false witness who pours out lies. And look, this isn't the only time in God's word where we read about his feelings toward lying. Look at the strong language in Proverbs 12, 22. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. And even worse, look at the CEV translation. The Lord hates every liar, but he is the friend of all who can be trusted. Friends, this is, this is serious stuff. I mean, serious stuff. Look, the, the, the original Hebrew word uh, for hate or for abomination is tueba, which refers to something that is utterly detestable to God, something that he believes is utterly disgusting. Did you know that God uses that same word earlier in Scripture to describe his feelings towards his people that were worshiping fake gods? They were worshiping pagan idols. Lying is so repulsive to God, it's similar to as if you were worshiping a completely different God. Now, your question might be, well, why? Why why would God hate lying so much? Because it's the complete opposite of who God is. God is truth. God does not lie. In fact, God can't lie because he simply isn't just a truthful God. He can't lie because he is truth. God is truth. Friends, I want you to understand this this reality this morning. So important. When you lie, you remove yourself from the throne of God and you position yourself on the throne of Satan, the father of lies. When you lie, you begin aligning yourself with the father of lies and you begin to separate yourself from the father of truth. How can I avoid speaking words of death into the lives of others. Stop telling lies. Number two, stop stirring up trouble. Friends, I'm about to read a verse to you that has serious, serious consequences. Now look, if this verse offends you when we read it, do me a favor. Please don't send me emails this week because keep in mind, I didn't write the verse. (laughs) All right? I didn't write this verse, right? God did. So if you have a problem with this verse, if it sort of offends you a little bit, I highly recommend that you just sort of take it up with the man upstairs. These are his words and his thoughts. Look, God has zero tolerance for someone that thrives on stirring up division. In fact, if you don't know this verse, God has serious consequences for those that enjoy stirring the pot for those that stir up trouble. And as you read his word, he really doesn't have tolerance for people who do that within his church. Proverbs 6, 12 through 15. What are worthless and wicked people like? They are constant liars, signaling their deceit with a wink of the eye, a nudge of the foot, or the wiggle of fingers. Their perverted hearts plot evil, and they constantly stir up trouble. But they will be destroyed suddenly, broken in an instant beyond all hope of healing. Now notice in this verse the reason why a worthless uh, and wicked person will be destroyed of all hope and healing. Why? Because they stir up trouble. Friends, it's a very serious action to stir up trouble or division, especially in God's church among brothers and sisters. I want to tell you this, my heart always breaks when I see someone in God's church stirring up trouble 
It grieves me to no end because God's word says that that person will suddenly be destroyed beyond all hope of healing. Look, if you are a person that stirs up trouble and division, then rest assured, calamity is crouching at your door. And God warns us, not only in the Old Testament, he also warns us in the New Testament that this will happen. It's a continuing theme throughout his entire book. In the book of Titus, in the New Testament, look at what God says about this. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and second warning. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. Friends, Satan is sneaky. He's very sneaky. And oftentimes he convinces a person that it's, that it's their duty, that they are actually doing good by going from person to person in the church to share a juicy piece of information here or a little gossip there, and they think that they're actually doing good. And typically, a person like this will start off a sentence by saying, well, I just thought you should know. Or, you know, they may say something like, well, um, you're never going to believe what I heard. Friends, this type of talk comes directly from Satan, and it will only stir up trouble or stir up division within the church, within the community, within your family, and with your friends. And scriptures make a promise for people that engage in that type of talk. Suddenly, you will be destroyed beyond hope of healing. Aren't you glad you came to church today? (laughs) Such a positive word, right? On a serious note, though, I, I hope you see and I hope you know how much I love you and how much I love this church. It would be very easy for me to stand up here and preach feel good sermons every week. But God has called me to preach his entire word. And sometimes. We need to hear all of the truths from his word. Sometimes we kind of need for our feet to be stepped on so we can see the error of our ways, so we can repent, so we can avoid walking down the same path over and over of death and destruction. Look, if you are stirring up trouble in the church, if you're stirring up trouble in other people's relationships, if you're stirring up trouble at your place of work or with your own family, then friends, God's word says, be prepared for serious consequences crouching at your door. How can I avoid speaking words of death into the lives of others? Stop telling lies. Stop stirring up trouble. And number three, stop dishing out the dirt. One of the greatest temptations of the tongue is gossip. And typically, it's prevalent in the church. It's an age-old problem, one in which even the Apostle Paul had to warn several churches in Corinth. In in 2 Corinthians 12.20, we find Paul's comments. Here's what he has to say. For I am afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find, and you won't like my response. I'm afraid that I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. You see, gossip and its effects, they're not a new problem for God's church. It's an age-old problem. It's as old as the church itself. And people in the church have often tried to, to use many ways of masking gossip, gossip or to hide gossip. Look, in many churches, this is the classic one. You've all heard this, right? In many churches, this is how people mask gossip. Now look, I'm only telling you this because I want you to pray about it. How many times have you heard that, right? I'm only telling you this. Don't tell anyone I told you, but I'm telling you this so you can pray about it. Friends, that's gossip. Look, let me me define gossip for you. Gossip happens when you share information with someone who does not have the authority to help change or give reason to the information. Let me say it again. Gossip happens when you share information with someone who does not have the authority to change or give reason to the information. Look, if you are not part of the problem or essential to the solution, then there is no reason for you to talk about a private matter. Simple as that. 
Church, I want to challenge each of you to avoid this temptation of the tongue. It's a nasty one. Look, if someone comes up to you and says, oh, oh, I want to tell you something I heard. Or if they say, you're never going to believe what I found out about this person. I want you to lovingly tell them that you don't want to be a part of gossip. Look, if someone wants to tell you something and you don't have the authority to change the outcome, then do not engage in the conversation. And look, if that person continues to share gossip with you, then you should stop hanging around them. Does that seem a little harsh? Well, it's not my words. It's God's. Proverbs 20, 19. A gossip goes around telling secrets, so don't hang around with chatterers. Proverbs 16, 28. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. Look, friends, you you cannot build unity between friends. You cannot build unity between family. You can't build unity within the church if gossip is at the forefront of your lips. You have to avoid the trappings of this temptation. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have to tame your tongue from spreading rumors and even spreading facts. How can I avoid speaking words of death into the lives of others. Stop telling lies. Stop stirring up trouble. Stop dishing out the dirt. And number four, this is a tough one too. Stop passing along false information. Did you know that gossip has a best friend and his name is slander? They often hang out together. They even sometimes walk hand in hand. You see, slander is a false or malicious statement about someone. Typically, slander happens when we pass along negative information that we've heard, but we're not 100% sure if the information is true or not. You see, when we say to someone, hey, 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 did you hear that so-and-so did this? Did you hear that so-and-so said this? We often find out later that what we heard was completely wrong information. Or maybe we were passing on an outright lie that was initiated by someone with evil intent. And in such a situation, I've seen this many times, in such a situation, it's very easy for someone to say, well, uh, I'm innocent. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know it was a lie. I didn't know it was bad information. But friends, according to God's word, you are not innocent. If you would have recognized that that was gossip in the first place, then you would have never listened or acted on the information that you originally heard. But now, because you said something, the Bible now says you're guilty of slander. But look, don't take my word for it, right? Take God's word for it. Here's what God says about slander and passing along false information. Psalm 140, 11. Very encouraging verse here. Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent man speedily. Proverbs 10, 18, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. Now, once again, friends, God has serious consequences for those that engage in slander. And you see, the best way to avoid the temptation of slander is to avoid the temptation of spreading gossip or listening to gossip. You see, a sign of a strong and mature Christian is one that does not gossip, does not slander, and lovingly informs others of when they are falling short of the way in which God wants them to use their tongue. You see, slander, the the spreading of false information, it's a very, very serious offense to God. And unfortunately, it's just all too common in this day and age. What if we were to be different? GCC, what if we were to be different? What if we were to be a people that spoke words of love and life and encouragement, not words that bring about death and destruction and division? How can I avoid speaking words of death into the lives of others? Stop telling lies. Stop stirring up trouble. Stop dishing out the dirt. Stop passing along false information. And number five, stop breaking confidences. 
This is an interesting one. The fifth temptation of the tongue refers to the act of revealing someone's personal information or breaking a confidence. You see, our God is a faithful God, and we are to model his actions. He's faithful. We should be faithful. You see, when someone shares with us something personal, maybe it's a struggle or a hardship that they're going through, we should be a person that is faithful. We should be a person that is trustworthy. Not someone that spreads people's business as we break their confidence in us. I want to show you what God has to say about people that reveal others' personal information. Proverbs eleven thirteen. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Look, I don't know about you, but there is nothing worse than trusting someone with personal information only later to realize that information has been spread around the office or it's been spread around the family or it's been spread around the church. You see, as a Christian, as someone that identifies with the teachings of Jesus, we, friends, we should be a safe haven of trust for others. When others share something they are going through, something they are struggling with, something they need help with, we should be a mighty pillar of strength for that person. Now look, I want to make sure you understand uh, what I'm saying, but more importantly, what God's word is saying. I am not talking about being a person that conceals illegal activity or dangerous or hurtful activities. Look, if someone told me about a a sexual abuse or a potential harmful situation, you better believe I would not keep that secret and it would go directly to the authorities. God is saying, this is what we're talking about today though, God is saying that if someone comes to you in confidence with a struggle or with a situation and that person is living out the words found in the book of James where it says that we are to confess our faults to each other. If someone comes to you in that mindset as a Christian, you need to make sure that the information that they just shared with you stays private and that through your tongue, the information does not become public. When someone shares something with you and you agree to not share it, that means that you will live up to your promise and you will silence your tongue. You see, the problem is that we often enjoy sharing private information with others because it kind of makes us feel important, right? We enjoy sharing tasty tidbits of of private information But when we do, we become like Proverbs 18.8, where it says, The words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the body. Friends, we must avoid the temptation of breaking confidences. We have to do that so that that we can be a true, safe place for people to not only share their faults and failures, but also their weaknesses and their struggles. We have to avoid this deadly trap so that we can speak words of life and love over others. Friends, your words are important. So important that I'm willing to to talk to you today about topics that are rarely talked about in church, rarely talked about. I care about you greatly. And my prayer is that that these realizations today will help you overcome the, 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 the deadly, destructive temptations of the tongue. How can I avoid speaking words of death in the lives of others? Friends, you've got to stop telling lies. Stop stirring up trouble. Stop dishing out the dirt. Stop passing along false information. And stop breaking confidences. Whew, now that's only five of the ten. My goodness. That's the five, five of the ten temptations of the tongue. And look, my guess is that those five are plenty for us to work on this week. So next week, we are going to look at five more incredibly challenging temptations of the tongue in an effort to to bring words of life and love into our heart and into our mind so that then they will pour, pour out of our mouth. Look, friends, this is very challenging stuff. It's very challenging, right? I'm not about to stand up here and act as if I've got all of these areas perfect in my life. Truth is, I don't. And the truth probably is you don't either, right? My guess is that many of you have suffered from some of these temptations for many years 
I believe that many of you have probably suffered from Satan's strongholds in some of these areas. Maybe, maybe for you, maybe you've come to know lying and gossip and slander as sort of good friends, right? Maybe you're sort of buddy-buddy with them. Maybe they've become a part of you. And maybe it wasn't until just now in this service that you realize how Satan has been tricking you these many years. Friends, if you want to get rid of this stronghold in your life, then I very quickly want to give you two changes that have to happen in your life. They have to happen. First, you must become accountable for the words you speak. And then second, you must allow yourself to be corrected when you mess up. Accountability and correction. You must allow people you trust to hold you accountable and help correct you when you engage in any of these sins, in any of these temptations. Look, maybe for you, maybe that person that needs to hold you accountable or, or help correct you, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's even your pastor. But allow someone to lovingly tell you when you are sinning with your tongue. And look, don't get offended, right? Don't get offended if someone lovingly tells you this. Don't get offended when someone sheds light on a lie or a gossip or a slander. Embrace the fact that they love you enough to realize the dangerous path that you are walking down. They love you enough to know that if you continue to go into these temptations of the tongue, then God will have serious consequences for you. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, this week and next week, we're not going to be talking a lot about how to fix these temptations or how to overcome them. That's going to be two weeks from now. So what can you be doing this week and next? Step one, seek the Holy Spirit in prayer and ask him to reveal to you which of these five areas need attention in your life. Begin to ask him for his guidance in overcoming these, temp these temptations of the tongue. And then step two, ask a trusted friend if they have observed a stronghold in any of these areas in your life. Look, my guess is that if you honestly ask a friend to tell you, then they will lovingly let you know the areas that they see in your life where you are struggling, whether it's lying or gossip or slander or stirring up trouble or breaking confidences. And look, as they begin to speak into your life, as they begin to, to tell you the areas they see that you are struggling in, you have to allow yourself to be corrected. Don't argue with their assessment, right? Embrace it, learn from it, and get ready to start making God-honoring changes that will bring you greater fulfillment and greater blessings from God.